I'm here with Mark Shepard. You won't believe this farm. We got to walk around here a little bit last night. This is absolutely amazing. I found Mark through Jeff Larton, through the stun <laughs> method. You remember that? I sure like do. Three years ago. Yeah. Sheer, total, utter neglect. And I guess we have to clarify that a little bit. It's not like sheer total utter neglect. It's strategic. <laughs> you got to know when okay. you can neglect something totally and when not to. Okay. But um, part of the whole overall gist of the story is I got bit by the permaculture bug probably way back in 1986, I think, <clears throat> when I first encountered uh, a clip from a um, like an Australian public television series, The Global Gardener. You can find it on YouTube these days. And in there. Uh, Bill Mollison said that by observing nature and imitating those systems, we can create systems, food producing systems that, that are um, uh, ecologically sound and economically profitable. And I thought to myself, well, that's, that's it. That's like the holy grail of, of agriculture and civilization is if we can design systems that are ecologically sound, there's no problems except for what you'd find naturally normally on planet Earth. Uh, and then if they're economically profitable and you pay your bills with it, you know, all yeah. the better. Through a long story, my wife Jen and I, we eventually, uh, I got a piece of property in southwest Wisconsin, 110 acres of land. And when we got here, much of it looked like this over here. Is this your neighbor? This is the neighbor. Okay. This is, uh, this is 60 acres of, right now it's corn, soybeans, and uh, hay. So about a third of it was in uh, abandoned corn stubble, and two thirds of it was, was grass that was grazed as close as this lawn, if not closer. So, so it was a very degraded landscape, erosion gullies through several of the different valleys that go down through it. And in 20 years, by following natural principles, by observing nature and imitating natural plant communities and going through the successional process strategically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten to a system now that we're 98% we're um, perennial, whereas all of the uh, products coming off the farm, um, are they keep growing back year after year after wow. year. And we actually do produce like our own food. It's not really all that <laughs> difficult if you actually design a system to do that. And it's not going to happen with two or three berry bushes in the backyard. You know, we, we're, we're big people. We eat a lot. And so, uh, you know, we, uh, we've been a commercial operating farm since then, first selling certified organic produce. Wow. And then as the different layers of uh, uh, production came along, we've sold, bought and sold everything throughout the years. Uh, right now, the big, the big ones are the produce, the uh, nursery. And now that I've gotten gray hair in my chin and stuff like that, I do a lot of teaching and designing for other folks. Let's go walk around my yeah. place and we'll see yeah, some uh, things. Okay, so your your neighbor, does he absolutely think you're nuts? Um, soy? Yeah, probably. And this perennial. Is all, this is all GMO soy and corn. Yeah. It's the BT corn and, and uh, Roundup Ready soy. They have to drive this big, huge $100,000 tractor across that field. What's so, your most expensive piece of equipment? Most expensive piece of equipment um, is actually the tractor. Are we um, talking a hundred thousand dollar tractor? No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. A uh, thousand bucks. It had a, uh, a seized engine. Why uh, on earth would you buy a tractor with a seized engine? Okay. Because then for another thousand bucks, I could get one with a um, uh, destroyed transmission. Uh, and then you have the neighbor swap the two, and now you get a whole complete tractor. Nice. Um, we can go down the other end where we'll get better sunlight for the camera. Okay. Part of what permaculture teaches us is we are to observe. Yes. Learn the system conditions. What makes the system work, whether it's uh, highly effective or ineffective, and then use what we have learned from our observation to put together a system that that uh, that unfolds earth care, people care, and some okay. sort of equitable system that redistributes surplus back into the system and um, helps others to do the same. I have no idea. How, how much how many chestnuts we get but it's uh, claimed that you get about you know somewhere between 1500 and 2000 pounds of chestnuts per acre and and these of course are some of the oldest um, hazelnut bushes around here these are all american selections uh you know there's probably some european in some of them so they're a, they're a shrub type they're resistant to the disease eastern filbert blight which is why there isn't a, a large hazelnut industry anywhere other than Oregon and Washington because they're based on European hazels. When I got started here, I called um, Michigan State University for some information about chestnuts because Michigan's one of the larger states in the country growing chestnuts. And I said, well, I want to grow chestnuts. Um, you know, where do you live? Wisconsin. And the guy's like, oh, okay. I said, well, um, 
you know, well, what, what, what should I do? He says, well, first of all, you go find the uh, named varieties, the grafted named varieties that have a proven production record over 20 years or so, and then you plant those named varieties in your orchard, and you plant the rows, you plant the rows 30 feet apart, and you put each tree 30 feet apart, so it'll be about 50 trees per acre. So I'm kind of doing the pencil uh, on, on the back of the envelope and kind of adding this all up. So I got 50 trees. It just didn't seem like enough. And when you get on 110 acres that was just like grass and abandoned crop field and you're thinking 50 trees, just they just disappear, you know? And so I got these little trees in the ground and like they seem like a million feet apart. Uh, so I said, okay, well, what are the named varieties in Wisconsin that have the 20 year proven track record that'll work? Was, well, there aren't any. It's like, well, gee, thanks for the help my friend you know and then well then what am i supposed to do once you got those proven track record varieties then you take care of this this orchard you do these many fungicide sprays these many herbicide sprays uh, these many pesticide sprays during the year for seven to ten years before you start to generate revenues it's around uh four to five thousand dollars an acre to set up with only 50 trees then three thousand dollars a year for you know seven to ten years before you generate revenues now wait a minute I start up costs is, is five thousand an acre plus three thousand maintenance costs. But if we go five, and then three, 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 five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's so three thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand dollars per acre before I ever generate revenues. I couldn't afford that. It's just myself, my wife, living in the house that we're building around us with a little baby and another one on the way. We can't do that. Well then, okay, what about the variety problem? How do we deal with the fact that there are no known varieties that do well here? And so once again, I go back to the permaculture thing. Let's observe nature. How does nature uh, produce enough uh, plant material so they can survive, you know, windstorm, fire, tornadoes, grazing, browsing, earthquakes, volcanoes, pests, diseases? Well, it, a, a tree puts out like a zillion seeds. Every seed is a genetically unique individual. Out of those zillion seeds that go into the ground, they're usually really close to one another. There's competitive effects between them. There's synergistic effects between them and, and other organisms in the soil or whatnot. And the ones that are most suited for the site, the weather conditions, the disturbance regime, for real, no fake. I mean, all the bugs that come at them, these trees have to survive somehow. That's how nature does it. And if nature didn't work, this planet would have been a bare cinder when we got here. Mm -hmm. It works really, really well. So we figured we'd imitate that. So at first what we did is we got a wide diversity of chestnut genetics and did this for all of the different woody species we're working with, pine nuts, hazelnuts, apples included. And you plant a zillion of these different varieties, most of them seedlings. Because um, we're told, oh, don't bother to save your fruit seeds because it doesn't bro uh, breed true to type. It's like, excuse me, when was the last time you took an apple seed and put it in the ground and it turned into anything other than an apple? Mm. Our seeds breed true to type. They don't look exactly like their parents. That's the whole point of sexual reproduction. You don't look like your parents. Your brothers and sisters don't look like you. That's the whole point. We want the genetic variations that show up and survive right here with stun, strategic total utter neglect. So what you'll see in here, there's a lot of trees that are dying. Um, and the reason why is because uh, we have some trees that are American chestnut, which is susceptible to chestnut blight. We have a uh, Chinese chestnut that isn't cold hardy enough for Wisconsin. So how do, how do you start growing chestnuts when the two varieties that you could use won't survive in Wisconsin? Well, we have a lot of European chestnuts that also are not cold hardy enough here. And then I got a whole bunch of different hybrids which are already crosses between Chinese and, and American and European and American, that sort of thing. Well, we breed them mm -hmm. and you just put them in the ground and the ones that die don't get to reproduce. You know, if you look at you like, the one by like that one right there. This <laughs> one right now is not contributing to the gene pool. And <laughs> that's perfect. And so when all of a sudden the disease comes through, do I get all freaked out and say, oh, I gotta prevent the disease. It's like, no, that's reality. I'm not gonna prevent reality. So let's take an apple orchard, for example. 100% of all of the problems in an orchard uh, are because we're, we're trying to create reality through our idea of orchard and orchard is purely a human construct this is some idea that somebody came up with once upon a time so what we do is we take this plant an apple tree or a pear tree whatever out of its natural context of living with the real world put it in a block all by itself now we've concentrated apple in one place what does it do it attracts all the pests and diseases that attack apples and so when a pest comes in so oh no we have a problem well the problem was caused by the fact that you had this idea of orchard 
and, it, and it's not real. It's false idea. That's not how nature works. So what we do here is we let things go as wild and natural as possible. And when a, a pest or a disease comes in, you let it run its course with uh, pests, for example. In order to get good pest control, the pest has to come in. So let's, let's say it's a chestnut pest. They come in and eat the chestnuts. Uh, the population booms because there's no control mechanism in place. You need enough pests in order to feed the predators of the pests. So if I sprayed to get rid of the pests, I'd never have enough uh, pests to feed predators. Um, and, and then so on up the food chain. So what'll happen in the early years, you'll have an amazing amount of pest pressure and then it drops down. Does it go away? No, it's always here. We always have the pests, all the apple pests in the world we have. But you get a lower level than you would have in the, than in the early years. Uh, same with the disease. Now with chestnuts, it's really fascinating is um, with chestnut blight in American, it's, it's shown that it's, it's the genetic resistance within the plant. Same with Eastern filbert blight and hazelnuts. Is it something genetic within the plant that allows it to survive against that disease? So my idea in the early years was with the Chinese genetics, let's get some Chinese genetics in here to be disease resistant to chestnut blight, some American genetics in here to be cold hardy, and you cross the two and then we'll have these chestnut trees that are adapted and survivable. Now how can I ever know that my plants are resistant to a disease unless I have enough disease around? So I wanna make sure that there's enough disease around to properly infect my, my other trees. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of dead trees and they, they kind of thin themselves. They just get the disease and they die back and then they don't contribute their susceptibility genes back to the gene pool. We keep saving our seed uh, and keep rolling forward. And we've got some really productive trees. We got some duds and when you got a dud, you cut them down, you put them, you know, put them in the wood stove, keep you warm in the winter time, <laughs> or you, uh, you know, inoculate them with mushroom spawn and, and grow mushrooms. You never have to come in here and mow this. I, I do just before harvest. Okay. You're, you're talking about just where we're walking. Yeah. Or do you mow around the trees too? No, no, no. So they're telling me to put 50 trees per acre. So I did that. Okay. So now I've got my 50 trees per acre. The, the second year I had two of those trees because a lot of them are seedlings because there are no grafted varieties that will survive around here. Two of those trees flowered the second year and they were like 800 feet apart. And it's like, Chestnuts are mostly wind pollinated. They'll never pollinate mm. 800 feet apart. I had to put trees closer together in the row. So the first year I was at like 30 feet apart. Then the second year is 30 feet apart. And that was when I discovered the first one's blooming. And the third year I went and I filled in the spaces halfway. So now everything's 15 feet <laughs> apart. Then I started up on the ridge, putting them in six feet apart. And then I started back up from the bottom of the ridge going like three feet apart. And then by the time I shifted to the, to the north ridge, we're going double rows, three feet apart. Um, with a stem density of around 4,000 stems per acre. How could I do that? Because you look at the cost of these plants, it's costing me, if I'm buying wholesale, I gotta buy a thousand plants at a time, I can get them for five bucks a pop. That's a, like a fortune. Well, if I was saving my seed for my early ones, and if you take, if you take <clears throat> these trees that produced in one year, right? Put those seeds in the ground, you've all automatically concentrated the seeds that reproduce really fast, the trees that reproduce really fast then you keep planting those in a block together and you keep saving the seed. So that means in year two, you've got trees. Year three, you've got trees. Well, then year four, maybe one of these 50 to 100 trees that you have is producing five nuts per tree. Uh, now you're concentrating the ones that produce a uh, heavier yield because there's more seeds in the gene pool. So as you go along the line, you're concentrating fast reproduction, um, heavy yield, pest and disease resistance and how you know for pest and disease resistance because you're not spraying anything you're just letting it turn loose and go go wild what is happening and does happen is you lose traits here and there well that's why we keep bringing in prize bulls every once in a while of the grafted select cultivars put them out there and let them pollinate real live real live and listen listen to the birds i hope the birds woke you up this morning yeah they're beautiful you got a lot of wildlife here and grapes and these are elderberries i so, mowed this row of elderberries last year just to kind of start them over again so a tree let's say a tree dies yep you need to replace it you've had your nursery man grow it up how then do you just do you you just move some grass out of the way and put it down or what do you do move grass out of the way what do you mean what do you do to take that tree from the nursery. Oh, you just take a shovel and shovel it in the ground <laughs> and step on it. Um, with, right in among it. Yeah, well, there's, there's, uh, there's 
it's raspberries and elderberries, and here's here's a, a replacement chestnut, you know, right here. You just shove awesome. it in there when there's a okay. hole, you just okay. shove it in with a shovel. Now, what is interesting, um, who was it who said, is it Toby Hemingway, I think, uh, is, is who, who wrote that at a certain point in time, all of a sudden your system will pop, and it'll, things okay. will just go better. And it was probably like five or six years in that, uh, you know, at first trees would just die left and right and left and right. It just wasn't happening. And then all of a sudden at some point in time, you could just stick a tree in the ground and it grow great. And um, I think a lot of that has to do with mm. succession. Our site, site has gone through succession over time, more organic matter, more soil life. There's no more toxic sprays. Uh, and a lot of this, the trees, their roots have associations, you know, with all kinds of, you know, soil life underground, not just mycorrhizal fungi. So that now I, I kind of jokingly say that, yeah, if I ever drop a tree, you know, on my way out somewhere, it just hits the ground and it starts growing. Um, <laughs> no mulch. I don't mulch. No I tried minutes. it first. What, what I'll do at the most, you saw that little nursery row up yeah. there. That's it. At, at the most, they'll get mowed on either side. Mowed on either side, but never in the middle. No, why bother? Okay, cool. You know, there's this myth Good. that grass kills trees. Tell that to the trees of the world. Tell that to the savannas of the world. Uh, yes, there's competition between the grass and the trees for nutrients and moisture. So what? You know, as long as a tree, and if the tree dies because it can't handle the competition, guess what? I'm not interested because it can't <laughs> handle the competition. Am I getting the yields that a, that a, a real on their game orchardist, and, and um, uh, I'm gonna butcher his last name, uh, Michael Phillips and Stefan Sikoviak. <laughs> Sorry, Stefan. <laughs> Those guys are masters at their craft. They are like some of the best fruit growers that I know of. They are so in tune with pest and disease cycles and all that kind of stuff. Probably either one of them would come here and throw up because this would make <laughs> them sick what's going on. But that's not the point. My yields are probably only 10% of their yields, but my costs are a hundredth of theirs and so if you do the math on that my margin is a lot higher the amount of work that i have to do goes way down this is typically the time of year anyways um that i go to the boundary waters and i disappear off into the woods for a couple of weeks or so because it's a hotter part of the summer you know the animals are doing fine and then the trees are doing fine they're just ripening their crops i'm out of here why work right so this vehicle lane is actually uh, the old State Highway 56. It's a state right-of-way. used to be where the road was, so it's now, you know, half a mile north of us here. This area was settled in the 1830s by Europeans. It was already settled here for who knows how many thousands of years prior to that. This place was covered with ash trees. It was a thicket of ash trees. Well, when the Europeans first got here, they had to clear out all this brush. And so then they constructed a road to get down to, you know, the nearest uh, village, Viola, which is, you know, almost 10 miles away. And so what this is, if this is the road going to town, this is the brush on the side of the road. So since 1830s, they've been cutting it with axes, pulling the stumps out with mules and horses, <laughs> burning it, uh, grubbing out the, the roots with Norwegian bachelor farmers. Uh, and then later on, as things progress, everything <clears throat> on either side was you know, then corn and oats and wheat and stuff like that. And then dairy cows and grazing. Well, then as, as technology progress, then they come by with the mower, the brush hog, and they start brush hogging on the side of the road. Well, then technology advanced even further, and they have what's called a wet blade, and you put a little herbicide in the tub, and it applies herbicide as you chip the crap on the side of the road. <laughs> Human beings have been fighting against nature here for over 150 years, and they've lost every single time. <laughs> so this is an there ecological is. model. This is an ecological model of sustainable agriculture. And what we have is we have two different species of hickory. We have cherries. We have grapes. We have mulberries. We have wild plum. We have butternut. We have hazelnut. Uh, we have elderberry. We have uh, wild rose. We, there's 10 different edible food crops right there. There's 10 different food crops that we can grow in the same place with 150 years of trying to kill it. So if you're planting, think about this, if you're planting food plants and you're trying to keep them alive, you're doing the wrong thing. We want to have systems that are so resilient that we can try to kill them and we can't get rid of the dang things. <laughs> And so 10 different woody species up above, well now what if we're grazing cows, pigs, sheep, uh, 
yeah, I was going to say cattle, but those would be cows. Um, <laughs> goats would like to do a lot more browsing than the, the, than the cattle and the, and the sheep would. Uh, in under, under the ground in here in the spring, you can find morel mushrooms. There's, there's uh, wild asparagus growing in here. There's gooseberries growing in under the shade. I'm already up to 16 different food plants in a system that they can't kill. You get that? Yeah. That's sustainable That's agriculture. <laughs> so I'm not saying that we're going to design our farms to look like this, <laughs> but these are the these are the principles that nature operates by that we need to observe, understand, and then imitate, and then we can make it easy to plant, easy to maintain, easy to harvest, that sort of thing. But there you go. That's that is That's 150 your... years of stunna. That's it. That's it. Sheer That's total it. utter it. neglect and abuse. You, <laughs> yeah. It's been abused for 150 years. Stunna, huh? <laughs> Stunna. And this is it. This is the original, or That's, you've planted something I've, there? I've, nothing. I've done nothing. Nothing. To this. Oh, there's raspberries. And there's you'll come and 17. harvest out there. Yeah, whatever's in there. Sure, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, if people want more of you, you must not, <laughs> people want if, more of me. if people want more of you, I'll have to gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to gain weight. Where do they go? Uh, and what can you offer them? Well, restoration agriculture development. We're we're uh, consulting and design and installation firm. We do everything uh, from farm and homestead design to earthworks installation. Uh, we do a lot of aquatics, uh, aquaculture systems. Uh, then the tree and shrub nursery, where we're selling our cold hardy pest and disease resistant seedlings. We also we're a networked nursery, whereas we have other collaborators that are doing similar things in different regions. And so, uh, no matter what the edible woody crop species is, we have have on the ground selection in that region so if you're for example from Georgia and you order pecans from us we're gonna give you the Georgia cultivars not the you know the northern Iowa uh, cultivars though they will have been bred and selected near you somewhere that's forestag.com but an ongoing um, educational uh, information that's online much of it is free we're called the Ecolonomics Action Team that's a contraction of the word ecological and economics we do between 12 and 16 uh, live webinars every single week that you know, be a member of the Eat Free community. And I think it's ecolonomics.org uh, to go join there. And there's different levels, there's more information available to you. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of hours worth of archived uh, webinars on how to live this way. Everything from finance to aquaculture to controlled environments, greenhouses, um, you know, chestnuts, hazels. I've done a forest ecology curriculum, a graduate level forest ecology curriculum that, that you can participate in uh, online, so go check that out. All of our instructors are doing what they teach. We don't have people who've just like researched it and are repeating information that they've heard. Uh, we're not just like an empty blog site where we're sending out these really cute posts. We're people who are living this way and teaching others how we do it. Cool. I'll leave the link to that stuff in the description. Cool. Mark has passed me off. I've gotten the kids. Mark's wife, Jen. Yes. And we're foraging for berries. Yeah. Near the house. Lily, you want what are to these? Try? These are Nanking cherries. Oh, you're trying to. They're bush cherries. You'll try them, Jonah. Come on. You'll try one. Yeah. Too sour. Yeah. No, it has uh, a pit in it. Look behind you, Lily. So Our kitty's pit. coming up. It. Go for it, Miss Brown. Squirt. And then our, that's our chicken behind. Spit out the pit. Our okay. last little chicken. One chicken. Is that the mascot? Yeah. Yep. At this One point. chicken left. <laughs> but you got the rain of the whole place. You even have to feed that chicken? Not that much at the moment. <laughs> Look at her. She's there. picking out on Jerry. You got the whole place to yourself, don't you? Guys, you passed up the mulberries right here. Up, oh, guinea clowns. Just stick it Are you in. Looking for bud? You like the mulberries? I'd say so. 
Got some on your mouth there, buddy. Mm. Breakfast. No, no. 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 She was telling us earlier, yes, the guineas do actually keep the ticks down the way she knows. She would be picking ticks off cats. And then once she got the guineas, significantly less ticks. He loves this. He's all about this. Mm. You went down, Mr. Brown? Yeah. Jen, thank you so much for yes. picking blueberries and other fruits with us. Oh, you're very welcome. It was really fun. You've got a beautiful place here. Thank you very much. Yes. We wish you guys the best. Thanks. And you as well. Good luck on your journey. Thank Please. you. Yeah. <laughs>